Did you scream for joy when Argentina crushed France in the World Cup? Is your favorite drink mate? Then you should read Jorge Luis Borges, Collected Fiction. Before we get to the review, I'm going to answer two questions. First of all, did I enjoy reading the book? And the answer is sometimes. And the second question, do I ever want to read Jorge Luis Borges, Collected Fictions? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Welcome to Whiskey and Literature, where we read and discuss the greatest books of all time, the best stories ever put to paper, and occasionally the worst story and all those in between, because all the stories are ours. And when we're turning those pages, we're sipping those bottles, those finely distilled spirits. I'm your host, Captain Mike. Last year in 2022, I watched a YouTube video from Benjamin McAvoy of Hardcore Literature about the 50 greatest books of all time. And I decided to read all 50 of these books, added two for good measure to get to 52 books in 52 weeks in 2023. Created this YouTube channel to share my experiences and reviews with you. This will be my eighth review of the year. Jorge Luis Borges, Collected Fictions. I cannot tell you how excited I was for this review. You can tell by my Argentina jersey, my Argentina flag. I have Argentina wine today, and I have a Mate Bombilla from Argentina. I lived there many years ago. I lived in Salta, Tucumán, Jujuy, and Santiago del Estero for two years in Argentina, and I grew to love Argentina and the people. And so when I saw Jorge Luis Borges on here, I thought, great, I got an Argentine author. I'm going to love this book. And unfortunately, he let me down, mostly. And speaking of Jorge, let's talk about the author before we talk about the book. He was born in 1899, died in 1986. Born in Buenos Aires, though he also lived in Switzerland for a part of his life. He married very late in his life in 1967. That marriage only lasted three years. And a few months before his death, he married his longtime personal assistant, Maria Kodama. And she has, of course, taken over his estate and has been uh, referred to as an assertive administrator of his works and his estate now. In fact, Borges, he commissioned a, an English translation of his works. And that was the rights to publish that work was rescinded by Maria Kodama. And she commissioned a new work by a different translator, Andrew Hurley. And I'll tell you, if I had known that before, I might have tried to find the original translation. And after having done a little bit of search online, I realized that that has been kind of snuffed. I can't find online. I didn't look super deep, but I couldn't find that translation easily accessible. This Andrew Hurley translation is certainly the predominant available translation of Jorge Borges work. And before we get to the book, I need to answer a quirky question for the author. Would I like to sit down with Jorge Luis Borges and have a nice glass of Baalbek and discuss gauchos, knife fighting, and Argentine life in general? And I would love to sit down with him and share a nice glass of wine because I'm always looking for an excuse to practice my Spanish. And speaking of having a nice glass of Malbec, this week, instead of the whiskey of the week, we have the wine of the week. I've been doing this interview in my mind this entire year, waiting for today. I had this jersey all prepared. I bought this in 2018 when Mrs. Captain and I went to uh, Buenos Aires, and it literally has been sitting in the bag for five years. I haven't opened it. You can see the creases right here, where it's been folded up in the drawer, and finally I got a use out of this jersey that I spent a lot of money for in Buenos Aires. So Malbec is one of the things that Argentine, Argentina does well. It is a wine that originated in France, but Argentina has kind of taken over it. When I think of Malbec, I think of Argentina. It's a nice, nice red blend. Goes great with meat, which of course is something else Argentina does very, very well. The beef industry there is amazing. So we're doing a Malbec because it's Argentina. And we're doing the Amalaya Malbec because this one is the only one that I can find that's from Salta. And Salta is where I worked and lived in Argentina for a couple of years. 
So I can tell you this is the best Malbec. We have drank several different ones, typically from Mendoza and, <coughs> and even from Chile. But uh, I always buy the Amalaya simply because it's from Salta in Argentina. This is 14% ABV. It runs anywhere between 11 and $15 at the store. You can find it anywhere, grocery store, wine store. Um, if your liquor store has wines, it probably has the Amalaya um, Malbec. So it's a nice, fruity, deep. I love the smell of Malbec. I love to eat a nice ribeye, a nice steak while sipping on some Malbec. And this is a good one, I think. You can certainly spend much more money on other Malbecs, but I don't know why. The Amalai Malbec at $15, I think is a great value and a pretty good wine. All right, guys, you're here for the book. So let's move on to Collected Fiction by Borges. There's no publication date for this book originally. This is a translation, of course, by Andrew Hurley because it's a collection of short stories that were written anywhere between 1935 and the mid 1980s. Of course, he passed away in 1986. These short stories are very short. Here there's 100 stories in this book, some of them as short as a paragraph, the longest being a story called The Congress, which clocks in at 15 pages long. I listened to this on Audible and I read the book on Audible and that version is not very cheap. So if you're gonna buy the Audible version, use your credit. I think it was like $27 for the Audible version. And you only get 17 of the 100 stories if you go with the Audible version. I will tell you though, the Audible version is read by George Goodall. He was an awesome narrator. He does several of the Stephen King books in the Dark Tower series. He also does Swan's Way, which on my list this year is the number one book. He also does a version of Crime, Crime and Punishment on Audible. And he does, as I scroll through the list of George Goodall's books on Audible, it just went forever and ever. Honestly, my recommendation after reading the 100 stories and listening to the version on Audible is just get the Audible version. Listen to the 17 stories. They're kind of the best stories in the book and then move on to something else. If you do read the book, like I said, 100 stories in here, 515 pages. That's kind of the specs and stats of the book. Again, one last thing. This is the Andrew Hurley translation. There was an earlier translation that was commissioned by Board Haste, like I said earlier. And that's, as far as I can tell, been kind of pushed out of existence and I'm sure they're floating around, but I have not been able to find one. The stories here in the book, they explore the themes of dreams, labyrinths, chance, infinity, archives, mirrors, fictional writers, and mythology. And in the book here, these stories are all organized by the date they were originally published. Okay, let's move on and talk about the stories themselves. And I will say, it seems to me that Borges didn't actually want to be an author as we typically conceive of what an author is. When reading this book, you often come across summaries of other books, other works from other authors, except those authors didn't actually exist. I'm going to quote Borges here and I'm gonna read this so you can get exactly what he said. It is a laborious madness and an impoverishing one the madness of composing vast books, setting out in 500 pages, an idea that can be perfectly related orally in five minutes. The better way to go about it is to pretend that those books already exist and offer a summary, a commentary on them. That's what word for word is what Borges said. So <clears throat> can you imagine a world where authors don't actually write the books? They just tell you about an idea that they had and that should be good enough for you. I'm sorry, but that is utterly ridiculous. A cop out. Sorry, Borges. I was hoping for more. Borges did tell realistic stories of gauchos, South American life, folk heroes, street fighters, soldiers, detectives, and historical figures. He mixed the real and the fantastic, the fact and the fiction. And when he stuck to those, these realistic, these realism kind of topics, he shines so bright. Unfortunately, he strayed so far from this during the book, I was just completely lost sometimes. Unfortunately for me, too many of the stories were just 
utterly incomprehensible or uninteresting. Let's talk about a couple of the stories that I did enjoy after I have a little drink of Malbec. Mm. So good, fruity, get all those berries, floral, very sweet. Go Argentina. So these stories I'm gonna tell you about, they're not in the order of awesomeness. They're kind of in the order of with, with which they appear in the book. And I'm gonna to refer to my notes here a little bit and even open the book a couple times for you guys. Okay, the first story I'm gonna tell you about is called The Interloper and On Come the Glasses. I read this story to uh, Mrs. Captain earlier today and she said, that story was horrible. And I said, I know, it is terrible. And it is so awesome because it is a terrible story. So I'm going to both paraphrase and read. So we have Eduardo and his brother Christian, who was an elder. And this story is being told by Eduardo at a later time and being recounted. And they were known as the Nielsens. They lived in a ramshackle house of unplastered brick. They defended their solitude. They slept on cots in dilapidated and unfurnished bedrooms. Their luxuries were horses, saddles, short-bladed daggers, flashy Saturday night clothes, and the alcohol that made them belligerent. They were tall, reddish hair, the blood of Denmark or Ireland. The neighborhood was afraid of the redheads, as they were called. They were cattle drivers, teamsters, horse thieves, and card sharps. They were men who sought the pleasures of the flesh, but their romantic episodes had so far been on porches or in the entryways or houses of ill repute. So Christian, he carried Juliana Borgos home to live with them. The truth was, in doing so, he had gained a servant, but it was also true that he lavished ghastly trinkets upon her and showed her off at parties. At first, Eduardo lived with him. Then he went off on some business, and on his return, he brought a girl home with him too. He had picked her up on the road. Within a few days, he threw her out. He grew more sullen and bad-tempered. He would get drunk by himself. In fact, he was in love with Christian's woman. One night, Coming home late, Eduardo saw Christian's black horse tied up to the post in the front of the house. Christian was sitting there waiting for him on the patio, wearing his best clothes. He said, I'm going off to that bust over at the Farias place. There's Juliana. If you want her, use her. And he left. From that night onward, they shared her. No one ever will know the details of that sordid menage, which outraged the neighborhood's sense of decency. The arrangement went well for a few weeks. And the woman saw to the needs of the both brothers with beast-like submissiveness, though she couldn't hide some preference for the younger, who had not refused to take part in the arrangement, but hadn't initiated it either. One day, the brothers ordered Juliana to take two chairs out into the first patio and then make herself scarce. They needed to talk. And then she went and lay down for her siesta. But soon they called her back. They had put everything she owned in a sack. Without a word of explanation, they loaded her onto the ox cart and set off on a journey. It was around five in the morning when they reached Moron. There they woke up the madam of the whorehouse and offered to sell her Juliana. The deal was struck. Christian took the money and divided it later with Eduardo. Back at home, the Nielsens, who had been entangled in the thicket of that monstrous love, tried to make up, take up their old life as men among men. Shortly before the end of the year, Eduardo announced he had business in the capital and he rode away. When he had gone, Christian took the road to Moron, there tied to the hitching post of the house, which the story would lead us to expect was Eduardo's Pinto. Christian went in. Eduardo was inside, waiting his turn. Christian, it seems, said to him, if we keep on this way much longer, we're going to wear out the horses. Maybe we're out to have her where we can get at her. He spoke to the madam, pulled out some coins, and they took Juliana away with them. She rode with Christian, Eduardo put spurs, to his palomino, she wouldn't have to see them. They went back to the old arrangement. Their abominable solution had failed. Cain lurked about, but the love between the Nielsens was great. The month of March was nearing its close, but the heat dragged on. One Sunday, Eduardo, who was coming home from the bar, saw Christian was yoking up the oxen. Come on, Christian said, we've got to take some skins. I've already loaded them up. We can go in the cool of the evening. The store lay a little south of the Nielsens' place. I believe. They took the troop road, then turned off onto a road that was not so heavily traveled. The countryside grew larger and larger as the night came on. They were driving along 
beside a field covered in dried out straw. Christian threw out the cigar he had lighted and stopped the ox cart. Let's go to work, brother. The buzzards will come in to clean up after us. I killed her today. We'll leave her here, her in her fancy clothes. She won't cause any more hurt. Almost weeping, they embraced. Now they were linked together by yet another bond. The woman grievously sacrificed and the obligation to forget her. As Mrs. Captain said, that is a terrible story. Horrible. And it's a great story because of its terribleness. And that is one of the better stories in Collective Fictions by Jorge Luis Borges. It was one of my favorite ones. I enjoyed it. Short, succinct. I could kind of see and envision everything that happened. I could feel the torment and I didn't understand the relationship that they had didn't make any sense to me, really. But I understand that brotherly love, that bond that they had. And anyway, I just wanted to give you an example in the best way I could without reading the entire story. A little bit of paraphrasing and a little bit of reading. So maybe you have a little bit of a flavor of what's going on in Jorge Luis Borges. The Mirror and the Mask. That was a pretty short story. I really enjoyed it. But really, the great thing for me in that story is there's a king who wants to do great deeds and he's talking to his poet right there at the beginning of the story and he says i shall be aeneas and you shall be my virgil and i love that because i have just read the aeneid by virgil and so while before i had read that i might have kind of understood the context there but having read the aeneid just now it was great it was vindication to me I was like, I know exactly what he's talking about. And so that was, a, that was a great moment for me. One of the other stories that I enjoyed was called The Story of Rosendo Juarez. And this is one of the stories that I'm saying that when Borges is talking about gauchos and knife fighting and the Argentine life, man, he shined. But, and this is one of the better stories, The Story of Rosendo Juarez. All right, the next short story that I liked was on page 158. And when I'm reading books this year, I come across sometimes something that just kind of strikes me. And maybe it's not really the focal point of the story, but it just touches something in me or makes me laugh or something. And this was the uh, story, The Secret Miracle, on page 159 in my copy of the book here. And it says, Like every writer, he measured other men's virtues by what they had accomplished, yet asked that other men measure him by what he planned someday to do. So he was talking about writers specifically, but I was thinking about that, how we oftentimes judge men or others based on just what we can see without knowing the entire story or knowing what the plans are. We make a judgment, but we get frustrated when people judge us not knowing the entire story. All they can see is what we've done, not what we're planning or what the thoughts or what's behind our actions. Anyway, that just struck me and I, I appreciated that story. The next story in here that I enjoyed was called The Encounter. And again, it's about knife fighting and gauchos. And in this story, these two guys are knife fighting and everyone's watching the knife fight, the duel. And they're all amazed because these guys, as far as they were aware of, didn't know how to knife fight, didn't have that skill. And the skill that they were using was far beyond what they should have been able to do while they were knife fighting but it turns out it was the memories, the past duels and fights in the knives themselves were guiding and helping the guys to have this beautiful dance of death. My second to last story that I really enjoyed was the Zahir. And in my book here, it's on page 244. I'm not gonna read much of this here at all. Here we go. So the Zahir is a coin in Argentina, a 20 centavo coin and talking about money specifically he says possessed without a trace of sleepiness almost happy i reflected that there is nothing less material than money since any coin a 20 centavo piece for instance is in all truth a penelope of possible futures money is abstract i said over and over money is future time it can be an evening just outside the city or a Brahms melody, or maps, or chess, or coffee, or the words of Epictetus, Epictetus, 
which teach contempt of gold. I read that and as I talk to the little captains these days about what they're doing with their lives, I'm trying not to focus on money and how much money you should be making and because money is not the end all be all, but it is an abstract. It is, I tell them it's the pen with which you write your life. It allows you to go and to do things. I bought this jersey. We went to Argentina. It cost us money. We went to France. We went to Barcelona last year. We went to um, Tokyo a few years ago. We travel. We buy this house. We live here on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And we do that because of the money that we earn. But money itself, it is the least material thing in the world. It just allows you to go and do. And you can turn that into anything. And that was the uh, focus of that story. And I actually kind of appreciated that one. It was called the Zahir. And the last short story that I liked is the shortest one. And it was literally like a page and a half long. It was called The Two Kings and the Two Labyrinths. And all I'm gonna say is, I enjoyed that story. Okay guys, let's wrap it all up. My thoughts on the book, on the collection. The stories that I just mentioned to you, they were some of my favorites. But I feel like finding these stories in this book is like hacking away at some underground mine. You're hitting the basalt, trying to find that one little golden nugget. They're in there. But it's so much work to try and find these couple of few stories. I honestly did not know what to expect when I started this book. And I was hoping for better. My thought was, right before I began it, like, you know, I'm gonna buy this book in Spanish as well. Because I like to practice my Spanish and I thought that would be pretty awesome to have it there. And that would be a good excuse to renew and reinvigorate my Spanish language. But unfortunately, guys, I'm just gonna pass. So if you wanna read Borges, like I said, my recommendation, Audible, 17 stories, and then move on to the next thing. Okay guys, usually at the end of these, I tell you about the next book that I'm reading, but because Borges, as I was reading this book, it took me so long because I was slightly unmotivated to read this one. It was just dragging on. I have moved on to a couple and I've hopped around a couple different books because I just needed to read something and I couldn't listen to this on Audible, so I just, I moved on. But coming up, I'm almost done with Middle March by George Eliot. This has been a pretty good read so far. I've enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to doing the review coming up soon. Guys, thanks for sticking with me. I hope you are reading something good and drinking something good. Turn those pages, my friends, and stay thirsty. <laughs>